Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a weekly show in which we talk about all things Beatles. It could be anything about their past, anything about today, and anything in between. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the co-hosts of the show. Some of you know me for my other Beatles program called Every Little Thing. Being joined by my regular co-hosts on the show, first of all, from Beatles Examiner, we have Steve Marinucci. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And one of the writers for Beatle Fan Magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also another writer for Beatle Fan and uh, for many different publications, a freelance writer that we have as our regular co-host, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we've also brought along one of our uh, rotating fifth members, uh, that being Top Fran Joan. Yes, the fifth Why is that so the he fifth <laughs> Do you want me to call you something else? No, that'll be just fine. Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to be back uh, <laughs> with my Beetle Buds. Good to hear your voices. And uh, this time out, our show, we're going to be centering on Ringo, because his brand new album, Postcards from Paradise, was released on March the 31st. And we've all had a chance to listen to it quite a lot. And um, actually, on the day of its release, I had the chance to interview Ringo for about 10 minutes on the phone, which was a blast. And uh, we're going to play a little clip of that interview in the show. And Steve got to interview uh, Bruce Sugar, who helps out with the production and has been doing so on Ringo's last few albums. And we're going to play a clip from Steve's interview with Bruce as well. So I thought... um, We've all had the chance to listen many times to Ringo's new album, and um, why don't we start with you, Alan, and tell me what your general impression is, and and we'll move on as uh, the conversation continues with specific songs that we'll talk about. But, Alan, what's your overall impression of uh, the new album? Um, My overall impression is this is a lot like other Ringo albums. It's pleasant. It's well done. Um, I think maybe the band here sounds a bit more like a band than often they do on Ringo's albums. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a good combination of, of songs. A lot of them are upbeat. A lot of them have, uh, that sort of backward looking thing that Ringo has been doing the last several albums, looking at his own past, um, in, in various different ways, I guess we'll get to when we talk about the individual songs, but, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of liked it, and it's grown on me with subsequent listens. Okay. Would you say that it's... it's um, is there a similarity between this and the previous albums that Ringo has co-produced? Um, you did say it's similar to other Ringo albums, but would you say more so with the recent stuff, or just in general, Ringo's solo career spanning all these decades? Um, I guess I guess it's most similar to the most recent albums, but of course that, you know, that voice of his, which is so distinctive, you know, whether you think he's a great singer or not, um, you know, he, he says himself, I'm not Pavarotti, um, but it's a voice that you can, even if you never heard a track before, you would immediately identify it as Ringo. And that's something that runs through all of his albums, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so there is that, you know, that kind of vocal sound. Uh, and also, you know, it's not just a vocal sound, it's a kind of persona that comes through almost all the albums going all the way back. I mean, maybe not Sentimental Journey since it was covers, but um, but there is a kind of, you know, hey, I'm Ringo, we're having fun one way or another here that you can always pretty much count on. And so, yeah, there's that. But in terms of production, sound, band sound, that kind of thing, yeah, the last few albums are are much closer to this, or this is much closer to them. Yeah, Ringo has his own way of injecting his own personality into the into the music. Yeah. That carries across really well in so much of, of his recordings. Mm-hmm. Tom, how about you? We're just going to give a general view right now, and, and later on we'll move on to specific songs. What's your overall impression of the new album? Well, with the exception of the title cut, Postcards from Paradise, which has a very, almost like a brooding sound, which is kind of bizarre since it's all about Beatles songs <laughs> or, or, or derived from Beatles songs. What struck me most about it, Ken, is if you compare this to something, let's say his last couple albums, let's say 2012, which was nice and tight and very cohesive, 
But then when you look at uh, the the one before that, which was kind of a multi a multi uh, producer kind of affair, the Liverpool Eight record, that record you know sounded like it it had different people at you know at the switch. Um, mm. I think the last couple, you know, and Ringo obviously is not known as a producer, but it's clear he knows what he wants the record to sound like. And for that, I, I like it, and I liked 2012 very much uh, compared to, let's say, Liverpool 8. And I think Liverpool 8 might have had, you know, as I say, a couple too many, um, you know, too many cooks in there. And it was it was long. It was you know, one of 15, 16 songs. Mm. And it just seemed like there wasn't, really really enough room for anything to breathe uh this as i said aside from the brooding <laughs> title track uh i hate to to you know simplify and say it's a breezy affair but it's it's very upbeat it's it's bright i was terribly excited to you know to learn that uh, he finally put the whole all-star band whichever one it was going to be <laughs> over the right. 25 years i mean obviously the you know, the connect the dots with all the players that have uh, gone through the band over the years. There's tons of them, uh, you know, one-offs and, you know, uh, you know, playing on each other's records and everything. But uh, to have the whole band actually do something kind of is a nice way of, of acknowledging that this band, which is now in its fourth calendar year uh, of touring, uh, really has, has gelled and Ringo really does view them as a band. Um, you know, as opposed to just, you know, the, the latest, uh, you know, the latest troop that he took on the, you know, on the, on the road show. Well, when you listen to a song like Island in the Sun, mm -hmm. I just said we're not going to get specific, mm -hmm. but would, would you, when you listen to that, if you weren't told that was the band, would you even know it? You know, that's a great question. Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. I do like that song, but I don't like it terribly much better than, Let's say uh, the track that, that precedes it, Bamboola, I love that one. That's a real fun mm. song. Would be great uh, to add into the set list. And uh, as we were talking about uh, just before uh, we, all, we all got on the line here, um, you know, the thought about uh, since it is the fourth, uh, fourth you know, calendar year going on with this ensemble, when they kicked off, the new album was 2012, and they're, uh, you know, up till the last leg, there was still two songs from that album in the set list, which in all likelihood are coming out. And uh, you know, maybe later on we can all place our bets as to what goes in. Oh, I already know what's going in. <laughs> oh, you do, D. But you didn't ask yeah. in the interview. No one did. Uh, no. How did you guys miss that one? <laughs> do you know how fast 10 minutes goes? Yeah. yeah <laughs> really? Yeah. I hear you. And I, I, had a, I had a list of... 13 questions, which I knew I would never, never get to. All. Right. Unless they were yes but or no he, questions. <laughs> but if he's on a roll and he wants to articulate and ad lib, I'm not going to step on him. You just let the man talk. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but um, uh, let's get uh, other impressions of the new album. Well, let's start with um, Al. How about you? What, what's your overall impression of this album? Very similar to to both Alan's and, and Tom's. Uh, I think it's um, it does have a, you know kind of a similar feel to the the what you might call the post Hudson uh, period uh, Ringo mm. albums, although uh, uh, certainly more, as Tom pointed out, more consistent. Than than Liverpool Eight had been, which uh, you know I, kind of bridges the gap of both both periods. Yeah. But uh, but also it's um, I think the songs in general are of uh, uh, there are some that are you know definitely more memorable than a lot of what was on certainly the last two. Mm. No. So you weren't you weren't that impressed with the with um Ringo 2012 and why not? Um they were okay. Um you know, uh they were a couple of concentrated listenings worth and then, you know, but there was really nothing on either of those two two albums that really stuck with me in wow. you know, in the way that uh say Rory and the Hurricanes does mm. it's which is very uh it's got one of those almost McCartney esque hooks to it. Hmm. I never would have thought of that as being McCartney esque, but uh well, that's I don't, what yeah, you I don't hear. mean that the music is McCartney esque, but the the fact that there's that kind of earworm type hook in there. Oh, obviously yeah. out of the McCartney playbook, you know. 
Obviously, uh, yeah, I should amend. <laughs> Obviously, uh, Walk With You is probably the, of those last two albums. That is probably the most memorable track on those two albums. Okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, also, is uh, somebody have mentioned this, and uh, maybe Tom and Alan particularly might be able to uh, get a word in on this. Is it possible that he's using auto tune on this album? I don't hear it. And you know something, my ears, I can pick that up pretty mm-hmm. well. Mm. Yeah. I just, you know, I and not it. only that, I just want to say one thing because in my family, I have my wife and my son have perfect mm-hmm. pitch. And to the point where when they hear auto-tune, they actually get a really bad headache from it. Mm. And um, I can pick it up pretty well, not as well as they can. And they've heard the album, and they don't hear it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I didn't so. really hear it myself, but uh, uh, somebody had mentioned it earlier in the day that they thought that uh, that he was using auto-tune on there. Mm. Well, you know, the vocals on this album aren't real demanding. Um uh, mm. And that, you know, that, that says something about, you know, knowing, when, when, you know, he's writing it, he's producing it. You know, he's not going to set something up that's going to be out of range. Exactly. You know, Hudson did a great job with him for years, you know, getting the songs, you know, produced in a way that, that he was comfortable singing on top of. But even some of those, when he got to, when it came time to do them in concert, like I remember... Um, the Harrison one, uh, Never Without Never You. Never Without You. Yeah, he was he was going uh, you know he was going off and uh, even mm-hmm. on this tour with uh, with Anthem. Mm. You know, yet Wings, he sounded right was right in his sweet spot. Really was. Right. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Do you hear it, Alan? Do you hear any auto tune? Um, I don't, and in fact, I, I hear a, a couple of places. I can't remember which song specifically where he's kind of on the edge of heading out of tune. So, oh, okay. Uh, you know, and, and with you know, and with Ringo, you kind of grant him that. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's it's not a big deal. It's it's part of that personality because it's not it's not unpleasantly out of tune. It's just like this is the Ringo singing voice, you know. And so, I, I mean, I think if they were going to do auto-tune, they might have fixed those places. It could have been done, you know, with just like a couple of cents of of, uh, of correction. And uh, I think the fact that they obviously didn't uh, sort of makes me think that they probably didn't do that kind of stuff on this. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if, you know, also, I don't know what Ringo's attitude towards this stuff is. I mean, we know that, that George was very down on – using electronic technology to uh to correct things and fake things in and you know we know that he hated midi instruments and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so you know it could be that Ringo uh as a sort of nice old fashioned drummer from Liverpool in the 60s uh would sort of prefer to do it naturally could be wrong, sure. but that, I mean, it's just a guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, in fact, there's a person uh, who is an, an acquaintance of several of us who insists that Paul has been using auto tune for a number of years. So, <laughs> oh, no. yeah, exactly, no no exactly. Way. You know, consider the source. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing though. I've noticed in recent years that there are times on Ringo's albums where he's going to sing a low note. Lower than you're used to hearing them. Because mm-hmm. I remember back when Liverpool A came out, Paso Dobles, that song is in a very low range. And I wasn't used to hearing him sing that low. But now he's more and more comfortable doing that. There's a note there in um, Not Looking Back on the new album, which is pretty low. Mm. And if, if he's more comfortable doing that, he does it. Yeah. That's his uh, frame of mind right now. So if, that, if he's more comfortable that way, then do it. Listen, who's going to tell a two-time Rock and Roll Hall of Famer what to do in that regard? That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's he wants to sing low, you let him go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Steve, how about you? Your general impression, without getting into specific songs, of the new album. Um, I had the album for quite a while before it came out. And i got to be honest, it, uh, I like number one, I liked Ringo two, 2012. It was on my um, my iPhone up until just recently, and I listened to it a lot. I really I really got comfortable with it. So it took me a while to to adjust to this, and I, I like it. I think it's I think it's well done. I mean, it's like 
you know, it's what you expect from Ringo. It's not going to, you know, hit you in the head, you know, and, 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 you know, make you have a transformation. I think it's very, I think it's nice. I think there's only one song that I really kind of don't like, but I think all the others, I, I think I, I, I do like. I have to say that uh, Postcard, the, the title song, bugged me for quite, for a while, um, especially in the beginning when I first heard it, but, you know, I no, I like this album. I think it's I think it's a good album. I'm not sure whether I want to say it's better than two, uh, 2012, you know, or why not? Uh, like I said, both I I like both of those a lot, uh, and I think it's probably it's along the same you know pattern, along the same lines. Didn't you give this five stars though in a review a week or so ago? Did I give it five stars? I, thought I think I, yeah, I thought unless, unless I dreamt it. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. I'm in trouble. I, I don't rem- I don't remember what I did now. But I mean, I'm just saying. I, you know, it's it's ringer for what it is. I mean, I, I think what my, what my logic in the review was that you know it's what you expect from Ringo, and it's not awful. It's I mean it's 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 good. I I, I honestly don't remember. I, if I did, I'm 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 in trouble, obviously. But because uh, I can't remember what I did. <laughs> the last week has been so crazy. It's just ridiculous. But um, I don't know if saying it's not awful is is uh, you know, <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's five stars. Five stars, exactly. No, I mean that's not that's not what I'm trying to. I, I, I'm just making a statement. I mean, you know, it, it's it's a good album. It it is. It's it's Ringo. Uh, you know, it's a, a very well done album. After you know going through and you know and and hearing about you know and and reading all of you know his discussion about. Uh, you know how he records and everything like that. I mean, it's, I, I think it's well done, and you have to give Ringo credit. I mean, this could be a lot worse than it is, and it's not. It's it's actually quite good. So, it sounds like you go into a Ringo album with very low expectations from the way you're talking. Um, probably. I have to say, probably. I mean, I can't I can't go in there and say it's going to be a you know it's going to be a a masterpiece because. You know, I mean, I well, I wouldn't do that with, with a McCartney album either. So, I mean, I think I, I, I think it's good. I mean, I, you know, I enjoy it. And like I said, it took I, I spent a lot of time listening to it after I got it, and it took me a while to, to get um, attached to a few of the songs. And it, you know, but what can I say? Uh, I, you can take that from what for what it is. Um, you know, I, th- I, it is good though. I'm not gonna. No, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna say it's awful because I don't say I'm not, I wouldn't say that. Although mm. to be fair, I think probably most of us go into say a new McCartney album with far higher expectations. Yeah. Oh yeah. Than a than a Ringo album. Yeah, I think I think so too. And maybe that's that might be a little unfair, but it's well, just the way no. it, it's just the way it is. I I do think that over the last the last few albums, he's definitely solidified what he does and it and you know there's a lot more it this album sounds a lot more sure than the last couple uh, I shouldn't say the last couple than the ones before why not I think starting with why not he really got a lot more confidence and he's really kind of uh um you know again solidified what he does and I think he's I think he's become yeah, again a lot more confident I think that's a, probably a good way to good way to say it so okay well, I would just like to say oh. that I'm very impressed with the album, but I, I really frown on more and more making fast judgments after an album comes out. I mean, I, it's true. I've listened at least ten times to this album, and even still, I remember when Steve and I did the show alone together, I waited a month before I gave a review of Paul McCartney's new album mm-hmm. because you've got songs in your head that are stuck in there and you can't get them out. <laughs> which is, you know, the case with so many albums that I listen to a lot initially. And albums need time to breathe before you can really give a fair assessment of what you think of of the album. But from what I've been listening to, based on the last few weeks of hearing this album, I like it a lot. I think that Ringo, the thing that impresses me more than anything else, I, I am extremely impressed with the fact that Ringo has written so much material especially since the Vertical Man album. I mean, Ringo, you know, you can go back to the Beatle days, and there were only a couple songs there that he wrote with the Beatles. But, you know, from Vinnie Poncia on in the 70s, 
moving on to the different people he wrote with, from Joe Walsh to members of the Roundheads. And in the last few albums from, say, um, well, well, Liverpool 8 and also Why Not On, it's been different people that he's written with. And I find that really fascinating. Now, I'm not saying that he's the greatest songwriter in the world, and I think we'd all agree he's not in the same league as John, Paul, and George as a songwriter, but he's grown a lot as a songwriter. And the different people that he's written with bring out different sides of his music. Mm -hmm. And so... Yeah. I think so. Yeah, uh, you know, you know the, I one think thing what you can say here is he's, he's, he, it would be very easy for him to do what a lot of people think he does, and that's phone it in. Okay, and mm. he's definitely not. I mean, he's he's doing a lot of the heavy lifting here, not just the songwriting, but also the production, and then juggling, you know, the rotating cast of characters coming in as to who's going to play on what. You know, some of it is going to be no doubt chalked up to happy accidents. Oh, you know. Joe Walsh just happened to be here for dinner, and he laid down a great guitar solo, uh -huh. stuff like that. Um, but he's he's definitely not just phoning it in. There's, there, you can't say that about it. I mean, so to your point, Ken, you know, the, the songwriting effort uh, is clear. Um, the production effort is clear. And, you know, that, that he continues that at this stage while he's touring. He's pretty much hasn't stopped touring since he got together with this band, right? You know, hey, look, this is uh, this is more than a victory lap. <laughs> and yeah. and in fact, uh, uh, the songwriting, particularly, that seems to be something he's very very proud of these mm. days, as witnessed your interview with him, because yeah. uh, it seemed like <laughs> as soon as you asked him about the songwriting, he was uh, very very charged up. Sure. And he should be. Yeah. I mean, this is someone who, as far as I'm concerned, I am just so impressed when you see an artist grow. And Ringo is about to turn 75 this year, and he's, he's still growing as an artist. And you can see that in the fact that he's done so much more songwriting, as I said, since Vertical Man on, especially. And, um, you know, he, he, he's grown as a, as a performer. You know, as we talked about on our last show, all these all-star band lineups. Mm -hmm. And what I what I sensed in the interview that I did with him was he was really exuding confidence. And he's very proud of, of what he's done and what he's accomplished, as he should be. And he's more excited and animated talking about these songs. You know, and I brought up a song like Bambula, which is could be my favorite song on the album. But I like the fact that when he's working with Van Dyke Parks... Um, and I like the song Samba, which goes back a couple of albums. It brings out a different side of him, this Latin side on one song, and then Bambula, this New Orleans sound. So you're getting different sounds coming out of him, not only as a songwriter, but all the percussive stuff that's being added to the album. So the Richard Marks collaborations, I like a lot. Going back to Mystery of the Night, which was on the Why Not album. That doesn't sound like any other song that Ringo's ever done before. And then, you know, when, you, when you're working with a different songwriter that has a different style and Ringo somehow finds a way in collaborating to make it work for him, you know, that is a talent to itself. So, you know, I am fascinated by all these different people that he's been writing with. Glenn Ballard's on there. Obviously, Joe Walsh, we mentioned, Dave Stewart. You know, I think there's a growth in there as a songwriter. And um, I'm just extremely impressed you know, in the last 20 years in particular, it's a different thing when you're working with Mark Hudson and you're working with the Roundheads because it's the same musicians over and over as a band playing together and also writing together. Here on these last few albums, he's working with different songwriters for each song. So you're getting these different styles coming out. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just very impressed by what I've been seeing. Yeah, I'm not calling this album a masterpiece, but I'm seeing growth in him in many different ways as an artist as well as a performer. Mm -hmm. Since we were talking about uh, the interview that I just did, and as I said, Steve interviewed Bruce Sugar, who helped out with the production, not only on this album, but previous albums from Ringo, the more recent ones. Why don't we play a clip now of me talking to Ringo about the songwriting process and how it worked on this album? I'd like to start the conversation by talking about your songwriting. Um, yeah, good. You've been more involved with songwriting than ever before. Ever since the Vertical Man album, you've actually co-written most of the songs on your albums. So um, many of the people you're writing with on the new album, 
you've worked on in recent albums. So who have been the most interesting for you to write with and why? Well, they're, they're all good friends, and, you know, we, we hang out together. I have an idea. You know, usually to start the record, I do sort of a basic track uh, in the key I'd like it to be in, in the emotion I want from a basic track, and then I play drums on that. So mm -hmm. usually it's just like a synth track and me playing drums. And then I call it, you know, like Glenn Ballard, uh, incredible writers. I mean, everyone uh, on the record is really a talented writer. Richard Marks, you know, uh, Sleeve Lucas, Urban, Van Dyke Parks. I mean, you know, I just have these ideas and I'm blessed because I'm, right now I'm living in L.A. and so are all these people. And uh, I ask them to come over and I play them a choice of two of my basic tracks. You know, once I've got like 10 or 11 of them down. And they pick one, and I've got ideas for a song, like, you know, with Richard Marsh on the right side of the wrong side of the road. And, you know, that's all we need, really. And then we can write a song about it because we know where we're trying to get. I think the shortest title I had was Touch and Go that I wrote with Gary Burr. You know, he's out mm. of Nashville. He's an incredible writer, and he was in... He's been on a lot of my solo records, and also, you know, he was... We were like the little writing team, and I used to call that band the Roundheads. So they're all people I know, Dave Stewart. I mean, he's, we always do the Liverpool one together. So I just have ideas. I write them down. You know, I sing along to the track to try and get a melody going. And then I rely on the other writer, and we support each other, and we turn it into, you know, a whole thing. Hmm. So you just do the basic tracks in the beginning, but you don't have lyrics, and, and your other writers do yeah. most of the lyrics, or do you write with them on that? Oh, no, we sit there and write. We are both together writing, and, you know, I'm there also to direct the song in the way I want it to go. You right. Because uh, once we're off, it could go anywhere. So it, it basically ends up with Peace of Love, or it's for Barbara, or, you know, it's like that's where it goes. And now we have Steve talking to Bruce Sugar about the recording process as well. Is there something about uh, what a typical recording session is like? Um, how does it how does it happen? Uh, well, I mean, I think he's told you before, we start out with, well, you know, with some grooves, just different grooves. We come up on the synthesizer, or, or he has a drum groove he wants to explore, and and then we have some tracks that, we, that he has. They're basically just basic tracks with keyboards and drums, and then he writes the songs with different people come over and write with him. And once the song's done, then he just invites different people over to contribute. You know, it's never really, it's usually one or two people at once, you know, so it's it's not like a whole band in the room. You know, it's basically uh, different people come over to overdub. So you never know. Every day could be different, you know. There's different people coming over to contribute on the album. I've heard him say that, and you kind of go, uh, you know that's kind of fun. It, it, it's kind of funny that he says that, but that really is true. He, you never know who's going to be, you never know who's going to be on it. Is well, that, whoever's around in town, you know, I don't know if people just randomly stop by. I mean, so a couple of times that's happened, but you know, they're scheduled. He calls for his friends up and says, "Can you come by tomorrow for a, you know, play some guitar or whatever?" You know, and yeah, that's basically what it is. When I listen to those two clips, I see a similarity there. And the thing that I found really interesting, because I've wanted to talk to Ringo so much about about songwriting, the way that he goes about doing this, it's very different from the traditional way that that we're accustomed to hearing. It's not like you write the lyrics first and the melody comes, or you write the melody and then you try to find words to fit it. Instead, what, what Ringo's doing on this album is he's creating tracks, musical tracks. He's getting a feel for you know the style that he wants in the key that he wants, and then he invites other people to collaborate on the song, to add to it, and build from that. And I don't know if this is a stretch or not, <laughs> but this kind of reminded me of, I remember when Paul Simon did the album Rhythm of the Saints, oh, yeah. which was the follow-up to Graceland, and he was talking about how he was just creating all these musical tracks first without having a song, and then building around that. Hmm. which I found to be really interesting, you know. <laughs> You're not used to thinking in those terms. But to me, this is kind of a similar approach, if it is, in fact, the same, the same thing. But um, 
I found that really interesting. Hmm. Well, you know, the Paul Simon thing, obviously he was he was going so, you know, so far out of what 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 we would call his normal comfort zone, even yeah. despite having done right. it once with Graceland to, to great great success. Mm. And when you you know what what's featured on those albums is you know this this exotic you know foreign you know foreign to rock and roll um, this exotic foreign rhythm and texture in the music so. In a way, I mean, I don't want to say it made sense to do it that way when he did it that way, but he, you know, he he definitely said that's what that's what this album is going to be about. It's not going to be about the lyric. It's going to be about introducing these rhythms and these harmonies and these chord structures and and these textures and everything. So let's let's really you know give that as much room you know to breathe as we can without having it being you know predefined, having its workspace predefined by saying. Yeah, but this is a ballad, or this is a love song, or or this is a fast song, or this is a slow song. So mm. you know, in that case, I think I mean it's, it, it makes perfect sense to do it that way. Ringo's you know production and how he put this together, and you know he he kind of glosses over a little bit in the interviews where he says, oh, you know whoever stops by the house gets to play on the album. Mm. Um, you know I'm I'm sure that's you know uh, not, he doesn't mean that literally, but to some extent it's probably true. The you know, hey, you know, uh, whoever stops by, you know, Joe Perry or, or whoever's coming by uh, is going to lay a track down, or Joe Walsh or, or whoever it is. I mean, heck, that's how McCartney got on got on Walk With You. Right. He's coming over there, mm-hmm. you know, for, for something else. And, uh, you know, he said, I know what I can do with this. I'll trail the, trail the vocal by half a beat, and I know that'll work. You know, so, um, right. it, you know, it wasn't written that way. It's just, you know, someone adding their own stamp to it. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment about how how Ringo is doing the songwriting and whether or not it interests you that it's a you know this different kind of approach? How about you, Alan? I don't know that it strikes me as that unusual. Um, he's he's done things with um, his lawyer son before and with Mark Hudson and other people, and they're just people around him who have an idea, I guess who he gives an idea to that they finish it off and uh, I, I don't know that it you know he's done he's done a lot of different things over the years and I, I don't think that this is that new is it um, am I wrong well I'm not sure how he wrote songs in the past talk about all the songs yeah. he did in the 70s with Vinnie Poncia that could have been a much more traditional approach to songwriting but you know I'm, I'm kind of wondering since he is a drummer if his mind thinks more yeah. percussive you know, when he's when he's writing instead of just, you know, let's write lyrics first and then see what we can do with it. That kind of thing. It it may not be that way yeah. with most of Ringo's songs. I was, well, yeah. well I, 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 and in terms of post the title song, he said that he gave the titles to Todd Rundgren and Todd Rundgren did the lyrics. So Right. Mm. Mm. Well, I don't think there's a percussive thing in there because, I mean, that's one thing that I noticed right out in listening to the album, how little percussion – you know, I'm how how uh, how much in the not I wouldn't say in the background, but how it was blended in. Drumming his drumming does not what I would call stick out all that much on the album, which actually to some people might be a little disappointing, but it it, it really doesn't. And and that so, you know, I was I would have been a, a lot more pleased if he had done that, but he did not. So I mean, do you guys agree? Well, there's some interesting rhythms on there, if not you know, what I would call standout drumming or very obvious drumming. Mm. Obviously, you know, he talked a bit uh, in Ken's interview about the song Bambula. You know, mm-hmm. you know it, it's, it's about a percussion instrument. So he, I think, Ken, to your point, you know, it, he was probably framing how that song is going to sound because of the mm. subject matter. Right. You know, I mean, that, that seems yeah. to make sense. But there's a lot of percussive sounds on that song. On Island, Island in the Sun, the sun. since it has a, you know, has that strong reggae mm-hmm. feel to it. Sure. Um, there's there's a bit of reggae on this album. Yeah. I don't know if you would call, would you call Bridges kind of reggae-ish? No. The song with Joe Walsh that that Joe Walsh wrote. It's got you know it's got a little little tinge of it in there. Yeah, I wouldn't call it okay. reggae. Hmm. All right, but I just um, in in a lot of the stuff that Ringo has produced or co-produced the last few years after Mark Hudson, I think he's brought the drumming up more in the mix. Yeah, 
Um, well, you know, as, as he keeps saying in the interviews, you know, this is what I do. I am a drummer. Uh, <laughs> so, right. It's been playing pretty much nonstop on the road. Even it's been, even if it's been, you know, pretty much a steady set list. You know, just playing, you know, constantly, not taking a couple years off in between tours and between, mm-hmm. um, you know, that he's playing regularly. You know, it's going to help that. Right. Well, I think in Ringo's mindset, just based by, based on the interviews that he's done, because everybody's talking about how great he looks and how healthy he sure. looks, you know, he just feels he's just got to keep moving. Mm. That's the main thing, just stay active. So uh, when he does tour, it's usually a month or six weeks at a time. That's not too long a period of time, but he does it every year. And sometimes a couple of, uh, you know, legs of a tour in the same year. Yeah. So it's still quite a lot of performing. What songs would we all say we're most impressed with? Let's let's go around again, and we'll start with Alan and say which songs you like the most, and why. Um, possibly Bamboo, um, and I, I think that may be a, a, a common favorite of several of us. Uh, I mean, for one thing, I, I really like Van Dyke Parks as well, um, mm. and I think that um, the two of them collaborating uh, is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, Van Dyke Parks is kind of, I don't know if you've ever spoken to him, but this guy is really a musical scholar mm. um, who has played every kind of music and written every kind of music and, mm-hmm. and has had a very long, deep career. And, um, you know, I mean, we all know probably a lot about what he's done with, with Brian Wilson, Um but, you know, with Ringo, and I think he's worked with Ringo in the past, actually. I can't remember quite on what, but it, it's there seems to be an association in my mind of uh, some tracks they've done. But I, I kind of like the idea of the of the two of them coming from such different backgrounds and, and coming up with something as good as this track um, that really does let Ringo drum, as, as we were just saying, um, mm. you know, and also sort of pulls him into a new area, a, a new musical accent that he hasn't used before. The title track in Rory and the Hurricanes, I, have, I mean, I have kind of mixed feelings about them. Um, part, I, I like them as songs. Um, I really like Rory and the Hurricanes. That's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess I, I have a mixed feeling about this looking back and writing songs about your history thing. I'm not sure quite why I feel that way. I mean, it goes way back to, you know, Mama's in the Papa's Creek Alley and Paul Revere and the Raiders had one, Ballad of Paul Revere. I mean, right. a lot of groups have done it. It's not that it's, it's that it's you know, unknown or, or just a, a lazy way of doing it. But Ringo's now done it so many times um, that it, it, it just seems in a way like, um, let me remind you in case you've forgotten that I am <laughs> one of the Beatles. Um <laughs> Um, and so, and, and yet, you know, when I was thinking about it, just when I was thinking about it before. I mean, if you're if you're looking at pop songs, I mean, why why is uh, you know Snoopy and the Red Baron any different than Paul Revere, the Ballad of Paul Revere, or one of these Ringo songs about his history with the Beatles? I mean, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a story. Maybe it's that we know the story so well that you know when he says it, 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 it when he sings it. It just seems like, okay, you know, we're singing the story again. Um, yeah, it kind of felt like the kind of like the, the third chapter of a trilogy mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, on these recent albums, you know, in Liverpool and, and you know, Liverpool 8, that kind of yeah. The other side of Liverpool. Yeah, yes, that's what I'm thinking of, right. So but then, then, this then again, Rory song, and the Hurricanes was Rory and the Hurricanes was you know some slightly different subject area for him. I mean, it's still his past, but we don't hear him sing or even talk that much about Rory and the Hurricanes. So it, it just seemed kind of nice, and the track itself, you know, it has that hook, as, as I think Al said, and it, it's just sort of a an, an up fun track. So you know, hey, fine. You know, I can't think of any songs on here that I really disliked. Another one that seemed in a certain way, I don't know, it wouldn't be fair to say a retread exactly, but uh, Right Side of the Road seemed to me to have a lot thematically in common with Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but yeah. again, it's not like it sounds like the same song or anything. Um, so, you know, I, I, I just sort of in, enjoyed them as a, as a bunch of songs. Uh, I guess those few I mentioned are the, the standouts for me, but I didn't, I didn't think any of the tracks were, you know, he, he could have left that one off. You know? Yeah. As far as the title track is concerned, how do you draw the line between it's showing pride in what you've done in the past, even if it means using the Beatles, or exploitation? There are some people who think that, you know, he's using the Beatle Association to help him sell records. I mean, at the same time, this is, this is a very touchy area, because I remember hearing, as far as working with Mark Hudson is concerned, yeah. and, and that there are reasons... Perhaps we shouldn't go into why they had a falling out, but we've been led to believe that, you know, Mark Hudson wanted Ringo to have the Beatles sound. It was more Mark's own, uh, I hate to say it, his own wet dream, yeah. <laughs> to achieve, you know, what he did with Ringo to, to bring out, you know, new Beatles songs. And he certainly is an expert craftsman at that, and he's a great songwriter. And you got Gary Burr, who's also on this new album, and Steve Dudas, who's also on this new album. Mm -hmm. And they all are just great musicians, and they can bring out the Beatles side, you know, of Ringo. And so I, from what I was led to believe, Ringo wanted to move away from that. And yet he doesn't seem to mind bringing it up lyrically well, in his songs. Let's, let's just, you know, I'm going to paraphrase the late, great George Harrison, who many, many years ago said, being in the Beatles was not a hindrance to his solo career. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I think with Ringo going into the Hall of Fame in a couple of weeks, um, there's going to be all kinds of, you know, built-in, you know, publicity and built-in, you know, coverage and, and built-in associations. And, you know, go count them up when you read it. It will say Ringo Starr, the Beatles drummer, was also inducted. Mm-hmm. Or Ringo Starr, formerly of the Beatles, or ex beatle Ringo Starr. It, the connection is going to be there anyway. So this time around, uh, for him to be looking back, I'm not sure I'd call it, you know, cashing in, but to say, you know, that uh, that there's motive and opportunity uh, this time around, um, you know, for the next sentence in that in that um, you know in that uh, newspaper article that's going to hit covering him uh, going in the Hall of Fame is going to say, you know, his new. Instead of just saying his new album, Postcards in Paradise, is out on Universal Records, it makes it very convenient to say, you know, his new album contains a song celebrating many of, you know, many of the Beatles titles and, you know, and that that's that's just, uh, as I think, uh, as I said, motive and, oppor- uh, motive and opportunity coming together very conveniently, um, given that he's, it's not just that he's on the road, it's that he's going into the Hall of Fame and there's going to be, there's going to be plenty of, of uh, of attention given to that. You know, it's got to be so difficult to be him. None of us can even imagine what it's like to be one of the Beatles. Mm. But you know there are plenty of times when he's interviewed and it's one Beatle question after another. Mm-hmm. In fact, in the last week or so with with the Conan O'Brien interview, which I loved and and you know, it was great in a lot of ways, but there's nothing about the new album. Oh. <laughs> you know, and uh the Scott Shannon on the one hand, it was even worse. I didn't even oh, hear that. Oh, that was one. awful because, I mean, basically it was Scott Shannon talking about how much of a Beatles aficionado he is and starts talking about Pete Best and he's got Ringo telling the same hoary story that we've heard eight million times about Brian calling him up to, to for him to play with the Beatles and then a couple of months later calling him up again and then calling him up to... Uh, replace Pete and, you know, uh, win tonight. No, I can't do it on Saturday. You know, we've heard this <laughs> so many times. And Ringo barely was able to get in a mention of the album. And that was it. The rest of the of, of it was this, you know, was nothing but Beatles redo. <laughs> hmm. Right. That has to I don't be know frustrating. How he up with it. Yeah. That has oh, to yeah. be frustrating. And, and maybe maybe Ringo and Paul should um, work out some sort of deal where they trade stories. You know, Paul, uh, Ringo should be the one <laughs> sitting there enough. saying, you know, Paul dreamed yesterday. Right. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, you know, there, there, is a, there is a what I'm going to call lowest common denomin, denominator element out there. Uh, I don't know if anybody went on Ticketmaster last week to get tickets for any of the area shows. So he's coming to Connecticut out here. We we have many chances. we got New Jersey, Connecticut, Philly, 
uh, and even in Brooklyn. And, you know, as I'm waiting in the queue at Ticketmaster, I'm looking at, you know, they have the, the stars and the reviews and, you know, I don't know, making up numbers. But if there's a thousand reviews, it was like 950 people said, oh, it was a great time and we get it and it was so much fun and blah, blah, blah. And then, you you know, there's there's three people <laughs> that, that will give it a one-star review and say, like, why was he doing Santana songs? Okay, yeah. there, there are some people that just don't get it. They don't they don't wow. keep up with it. They don't they don't even know what they're looking at other than, oh my God, Ringo's in town. Wasn't he with the Beatles? Maybe he'll sing She Loves You. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah. and there there is a certain you know, a certain piece of the of the of the public that is going to respond very well if postcards from Paradise wait makes its way into the set list. Uh, and every time he says, because we can work it out or because I want to hold your hand or whatever it is, it's going to get that that um, recognition applause. Um, it, it's kind of like saying, hello, Cleveland, you know, for three right. straight minutes, you know. Um, and, and there will be part of that. And there will be people now going, wow, you know, he made it all these years and he looks great. And, boy, you know, he looked great with Paul and they did the Beale 50th thing. And, hey, he's coming around and, hey, why don't we go? Um, at least down here, State Theater is. I think there's there are you know a few single tickets left. I don't think there's any pairs left. So I mean he's still playing the same size venues, but they're selling out faster. So you know that's that's a nice sign too. Mm-hmm. But my point about this whole thing about postcards from paradise and songs like that is, if he wants to move away from being asked so many Beatle questions, and I'm sure he realizes he's going to be asked them anyway. But if he wants to move away from that, isn't he inviting them well, I think, by doing songs like these? I don't think so. I think he has to embrace it at this mm-hmm. point. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's been a, uh, let's see, he was about 30 when the Beatles broke up, so it's been about a 45-year fight, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that I, he just can't win. I don't think, I, I don't think it's ever going to happen. Wasn't it just a few years ago that Paul basically said to him, and I'll, uh, I'll edit it, uh, said that, you know, Come on, you're a effing beetle. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think maybe that from that point on, maybe Ringo suddenly realized, you know, or finally came to terms with the fact that, yeah, that's what he's going to be remembered for as being a beetle, which is not a bad thing. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, I mean, you know, using the term, Al, you know, what they're going to be remembered for, obviously, yes. takes on a whole new. You know, a whole new um, meaning, you know, given, you know, what happened last week. Yeah. Uh, we had another death in the family here, in the mm-hmm. beginning, as I'm sure all our listeners know. Um, and this one had, you know, a bit a bit more mortality to it. I mean, she seemed to, I mean, she literally was family. It wasn't like, oh, this was an engineer that worked with them. Right. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of uh, people who, you know, who you know, met, you know, all, all of the associates and the family members and things at fests over the years, I, I talked to several people who use that same word. It felt a little more mortal this time. And who knows? Maybe, you know, at 75, I mean, there there is the, uh, yeah, as the Ringo song, the Ringo and Nielsen song once asked, how long can this go on? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's, you know, some winding down that's contemplated. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think he's ever going to get, he's never going to get away from the Beatle question. Because you're always going to have people like Scott Shannon, right. and Larry and Larry King, mm-hmm. and, Al, and Alan and Conan, who are going to who are going to be foisted on him in situations like this. Assuming I, you know, assuming in two years he does another album, the, the same thing's going to happen. And I think you know he's he knows that, and I think he's accepted that. Mm-hmm. And he's you know it's just it's just not going to happen. It's too bad that there are people like Scott Shannon that all they can do is ask those kind of dumb, dumb yeah. questions. I mean, that's that's crazy, you know. Yeah. And and in fact, also that shows again, like in the interview that Ken did, uh, just how enthusiastic he gets he gets when the subject matter is something oh, yeah. other than, you know, uh, okay. how did how did you get in the group? Oh, well, <laughs> sure. No, I mean. You know, yeah. last year, I think I've shared this story with each of you. You know, I knew I'd have my five minutes with them last year at a, at a charity event. Mm-hmm. And I said I could go in there, you know, with my Sergeant Pepper suit if I had one on there, uh, you know, and say, you know, I'm the world's biggest Beatle fan and ask me, try and stump me with a Beatle trivia question or something. But, you know, mm-hmm. I, 
I went to something that I knew would, you know, would engage him, which was talking about the All-Star Band. We had just seen the show the night before, and we're going to see one the following night. And uh, as you guys know, I'm a bit of an All-Star Band junkie. And, Mm -hmm. you know, fortunately, living here in the New York area, uh, every tour comes through here. And, you know, we've, we've been lucky enough, and I've had a chance to see each one of them. And opening the door with that, you know, he was completely engaged. Completely engaged. Mm. Yeah, and it was evident, Ken, in your in your interview that um, you know, I don't know how many you know, how many people were in the junket that day, you know, on the you know, on the on the Skype or, or you know, the the call in line, but I know they were lined up and you know, if everyone was asking him, you know, share a memory of John Lennon or what was yeah. it like when the Beatles broke up or you know how you joined the band or something, you know, he's he you know, you could you could see that there'd be less enthusiasm for that then you know when you asked him you know about you know some special songwriting you know efforts of his and which ones he recalls more fondly than the others and um you know focusing on his work and obviously the new album which was you know the premise for the whole for the whole junket you know uh, they appreciate that there's no question about that mm-hmm. yeah i mean you just you've been saying that no matter what he's going to go down as a beetle first anyway sure. But the thing is that um, while he should be proud of it, it's because of the fact, I think, sometimes that the media only talks about the Beatles with him. And that's what the public gets to see, and that's all they get to learn about. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> so weird. that's why, you know, he's, he's, that's why there, there may not be the interest level in his solo music, but yet, how, because how they do don't you, bring it up enough. How do you explain, though, you know, when, when Paul is doing something, whether it's his new album or a tour, and people will ask him something about, Paul, tell us about you know, the songs on the new album. And his answer will be, I wrote it, you know, kind of like it, we did in the Beatles. We did it very fresh in one day. And I think he's kind of playing almost like some form of reverse psychology. They're saying, hmm, maybe if I, maybe if I frame it in a Beatle answer, maybe they'll listen. You know? <laughs> uh-huh. on, the other, on the other hand, though, the word Beatles is what clicks. Sure. Okay. Yeah. People want, people want to hear about the Beatles. Uh, that's what, I mean, writing online like I do, I mean, you know, the word Beatles gets attention, whereas solo isn't going to get the attention, as much attention as the yeah. word Beatles will. Well, that's, 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 that's but, if, but if you don't bring it out, if you don't expose people to that, then they won't develop the interest. But, well, you know, it's, so, it's weird, Ken, you know, the, uh, the recent Beatles fest, Al and I were talking on the way home, and I said, was it me? Or is, is there is there less of is the solo material the the 1970 to the present yeah. somehow less re, I don't want to even say less relevant than the than the Beatle years but is it dismissed at this point because mm. you know, two of them are gone and you know in the you know we were just gauging it by you know some of the simple contests that we do name that tune game and the trivia game mm-hmm. and talking about anything or even playing well known number one yes. hits from the solo career, you know, yeah. playing, you know, the last few bars of Jet or or Band on the Run or mm-hmm. something, it was stumping the crowd. As opposed to, you know, let's say even I don't know, pick a number, ten, twenty, I don't care, years ago, the solo stuff was at least, I think, kind of still on people's radar. Uh it seems to be because of you know the the McCartney tours are you know they're now two thirds Beatles songs and uh, because of the the way a lot of the the press is handled uh, and framing things in terms of the Beatles when they release something new mm-hmm. um, you know and I I think you know the, all the the anniversaries because now we're cycling through fifty of everything and that's just too convenient a number I think it's it's really just kind of said you know the that you know the the period from you know, from after they broke up till now, is less relevant uh, even than than it had been. I don't, um, I don't, Tom. I don't think you can blame the media. I really don't. I, I think that I look at look at what Universal Capital does. Who, what do they market? They're not marketing solo. They're marketing the Beatles, and and because that's what everybody wants to hear. Yeah, but even when they market solo stuff, like the iTunes thing, when they did the. You know the four, the four, or, yeah, four uh-huh. artist batch or bunch, mm. whatever that was called. Um, even to take the solo stuff and try and frame it as Beatles music. I mean, you know, over the years we've done many articles. Let's say in uh, in Beatle fan, we had a, a long running column called DIY, 
mm-hmm. was, you know, do-it-yourself CDs. And mm-hmm. one we put together uh, a few years back that I still play a lot. <laughs> and, I mean, they, they are, by definition, probably the, the most common solo Beatles songs. But if you use the same charts as the Beatles 1 album, let's say Billboard and the, the Market Research Bureau in England, um, you can make a mirror disc that runs right about 79 minutes, uh, of just the solo Beatle number ones. And it's obviously very skewed. I think better than half of it is Paul. And there's only a couple of Ringo and a couple of John and a couple of George. But, you know, these are, you know, it's 20 number one hits. And when you bump that thing up against 27 that are on the Beatles one, you know, you're, you're, you're pushing 50 number one songs. And yet, you know, when you frame all those 20 songs as a collection or however you want to frame it, a playlist, a CD, whatever it is, um, you know, that, that playlist in iTunes didn't, didn't make much of a ripple. Best I saw. No. Right. Mm-mm. So I'm not sure even, you know, for as, as, you know, the thing plays like a dream, that list of 20 songs yeah. it does. Um, but I'm not even sure that there's, there, there should be, a built-in market for that, you know, to, to bump that up. Maybe that's a way to reintroduce the solo years as, you know, as an extension of the story as opposed to separate from it. In other words, you could have all this, uh-huh. um, you know, and you put them in a slip case or, you know, whatever you do, but you package it side by side with the, you know, the, the group product. And, you know, maybe that's another way they get it out there. So. Uh-huh. Well, you know, Tom, Tom, we've talked – um, all of us about the lack of sales of solo product mm-hmm. oh, yeah. and and the new and the new releases, and you know a lot of it just has to do with the way that the media is structured and the way radio is now. And yes. It's nothing like it used to be. So there's so many reasons why there's an interest level or lack of, but um, you know the whole thing comes down to the fact that radio stations don't want to program to who they feel are an older demographic. Mm-hmm. And if in their minds mm-hmm. they think that Beatle fans are 55 plus, you know, they don't want to skew the music to people in that age bracket well, because they feel that those people don't have the money to spend, which is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it's also assuming that you don't have younger fans to begin with. Well, it's also, and, you know, it also you know, puts a whole bow around the whole thing. When you look at the, you know, the, the years where there was, you know, measured and demonstrated success those number one songs yeah you know the the last one up there is you know end of 87 88 yeah. so now you, you know you're talking another you know another 25 plus years since yeah. you know that, that the most current song on it is is 25 years old and i think that's kind of been the window maybe i, I wasn't articulating it well but from the period of 70 let's say through 90 you know there was at least some spirited you know relevance yeah a sense of relevance to it. Mm-hmm. Um, since 90, uh, it, you know, it, there's been a market drop-off in it, clearly. Yeah, I mean, and, other than right. other than on, say, uh, you know, Sunday morning Beatles shows, oh, yeah. tell me the last time that any of you heard Got My Mind Set on You on the radio. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, there's, a, there's an opposite thing happening there, though, if you think about it. The solo material is more recent than the Beatle material, but yet the older Beatle material is is more popular. But but the question has to remain, why is that? Because the Beatles are the Beatles are the group, the Beatles are the phenomenon, the Beatles were the media darlings. I'm not saying the solo the solo Beatles are not, but as a unit, the Beatles as a group have a bigger impact than the Beatles as solo. Yeah. Yeah, no, no one could deny that. Right. But at least, as I said, the you know the the solo stuff I think bore a great more relevance while it was you know in those let's say seventy to ninety years. Mm-hmm. You know the the call it the the golden age of the solo material could probably be you know cut off right around there. It's not to say they haven't had you know great records or good things come out of the vaults on John and George since then. Um, you know they've made some incredible records since then there's just nowhere to put them let me just make a final statement if i may and that is and and i've said this before if you don't expose the music you're not going to develop an interest out there take a look at the success the beatles had in the 70s with their solo music it sold because it got airplay (laughs) you know people liked it and even in the 80s even though it wasn't nearly as successful as the 70s they still were there still were a lot of solo hits 
and big selling albums. Of course, you have to admit, well, things changed a lot because of John's death, and even with George, there was a five year gap there between Gon Trapo and, and Cloud Nine. But still, Paul managed to have more hits. George picked up again with Cloud Nine and the Traveling Wilburys. It got airplay. It did well. <laughs> so I just don't understand, once you get into the 90s and up, why there wasn't consistent airplay. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you still played the music, it still would have sold. <laughs> there was no drop-off in the quality of the music. I'm not saying every single album was great. You know, you've got peaks and valleys like with most artists. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people out there where Paul is concerned who would, who would say Flaming Pie is one of his best albums or Chaos and Creation in the Backyard is mm -hmm. one of his best albums. It's not like, you know, there was this tremendous drop off in the quality of his music. It continued to be strong for the most part. So, and yet there are probably just as many people, if not more, who have never even heard those albums and just immediately dismiss anything that he's done in the last, I don't know, say 20 years. You know, well, he doesn't really make good music anymore. Well, how much of it have you heard? Uh, right. None. You know, it's, well, you know, I'm sure I'm, Alan has probably come across this in the classical world of, mm -hmm. of artists who, you know, are, are, you know, are very important performers, and yet they can't get arrested unless they're playing, you know, something, you know, if uh, even if they, if, say, if they write their own material, they can't get arrested unless they're playing something by Mozart. Does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, something like that, yeah. I mean, and, and you, you you run into people who've won major competitions, yeah, and then sort of fade away. And I mean, in the case of Eugene Fodor, won the Tchaikovsky competition, mm -hmm. one of the biggest in the world. And and in fact, the only way you'd have heard of him in the last twenty years is that he did get arrested. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, that's right. Something to do with heroin, if I recall. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, it's 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 kind of. Yeah, it happens in all fields. You know, the, the, it's hard to to figure out how people can keep in the limelight, which is sort of what we've been. You know, Ringo, whenever he does something, he's going to be in the limelight. I mean, all, all he has to do is agree to promote it, and any of these talk shows will happily have him on. They won't, as as we've said, necessarily talk about the new project, but. But he, you know, he does have a, a, a sort of way of of getting the attention he needs if he's willing to do it. And for this album, he's certainly willing to do it. Mm. Um, hasn't always been in the past, um, but um, really, at least since Vertical Man, or even a, a bit before. I mean, he's been really since he's since he's been sober. You know, I yes. mean, since he started touring with the All Stars, mm -hmm. um, he's been a lot better about making himself available to the media um, with all the frustrations for him that that includes. Um, but this album, uh, this album seems to be sort of a special case for him because at this point you can't miss him, you know, I mean, especially also if you keep track of, of European media, um, mm -hmm. he's, he's all over there too, you know? So if you're collecting Ringo interviews, it's, it's a, these last couple of weeks, it's been a more than full-time job. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, um, it's a fascinating topic to to talk about people's listening habits and why people lose interest in an artist at a certain time. Mm -hmm. You know, this that's a show to itself. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's been half of this show. Probably. Yes. <laughs> but and maybe at some point we'll revisit that topic mm -hmm. because, you know, it really is a fascinating thing. It exp it does explain to some degree you have to put the media into this whole uh discussion because the the media influences us in leaps and bounds in ways that we don't even imagine mm -hmm. so um but but getting back to Ringo and and Alan you were just talking about this i personally think that aside from the Ringo album from 73 from time takes time on he's put out really strong albums especially mm -hmm. the ones with Mark Hudson mm -hmm. and of the 3 post Hudson albums, I think this one is, is the strongest. But um, let's go back to the album and try to wrap things up because, um, Al, what would you say are your favorite moments on the album and why? And then we'll get to Steve. Uh, similar to the others, actually, I would say definitely Rory and the Hurricanes for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Uh, I would say Bambula 
for the reasons, particularly that Alan had stated about uh, um, his working with Van Dyke Parks and kind of uh, taking Ringo out of, uh, in a sense, maybe his comfort composing comfort zone. And hmm. uh, unfortunately, I'm blanking out on the name of the ballad, and I don't have the album in front of me. Not looking Thank back. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a beautiful, beautiful song. Right. Those would be my yeah. three picks. And how about you, Steve? I loved Rory and the Hurricanes on first hearing. That one uh, caught my right attention right away. And by the way, I, one of the questions I asked for Sugar is, who's singing the backup vocals? Because the, mm. uh, they're not I did, really identified, and I tried to look them up. I couldn't find them. And he said one, he didn't know both of the names, but one of them is Dave Stewart's daughter. So, oh, okay. yes. Yes, so that that was very cool. I thought that that track is uh, is wonderful. I also like not looking back, and the reason there was because Marianne Simpson, Simpson is on the uh, on the violin. She is from the Ben Harper Relentless Seven group. Oh, right. uh, and um, yeah, I, and I love that collaboration. I, I, in fact, I was watching some clips from the uh, Why Not uh, d- days uh, recently. God, I just absolutely love that uh, that uh, collaboration. I also like Touch and Go. Um, mm-hmm. I'm surprised nobody mentioned that. I'm surprised then, you guys Yeah, didn't. that is good. Uh, I was going to. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's okay, fine. And I also I also have to say uh, I like uh, uh, Let Love Lead, too. Uh, I, I really, my if I had to pin it down, though, to, to three songs, it would be Rory and the Hurricanes, Not Looking Back, and Touch and Go. Well, this is a rare moment when I agree with Steve on something. (laughs) (laughs) No, because Rory and the Hurricanes is catchy as hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would be very surprised if he doesn't bring that out with the All-Stars. Considering the fact that he has been doing the autobiographical songs live, like he did Liverpool 8 live and he did the other side of Liverpool live. And it's um, it's just a good rocker right there. I think it's a solid song, great song to lead off the album with. Mm -hmm. Um, I like uh, Bamboola a lot. Uh, I do like, uh, like Alan said, and, and Al, I like uh, Ringo working with Van Dyke Parks. Mm-hmm. You know, I love Samba a lot. And uh, that could be my favorite song from that album, from, uh, from Ringo 2012. It's uh, got that nice Latin feel. Mm-hmm. Brings out this other side in Ringo, like I, like I said to him in my interview with him. I like Island in the Sun a lot. I like, uh, you know, Ringo doing reggae. You don't hear it all that often. Mm -hmm. And um, I love Touch and Go. I think that's a solid rock song. I wish he'd do that live. I don't think he will. But I think it would really work well with with the All-Stars. And I also happen to like Confirmation. I think it's a different type of song, just the way that it's, the way that the melody goes, the way it's structured. It sounds a little bit different. And Glenn Ballard wrote that with Ringo. But, um... For me, like I said before, I, I just love seeing growth in an artist. And the fact that Ringo, Ringo could just sit on his laurels and do very little that is demanding of him. But he, he's, um, he likes challenges. And just to continue working the way that, that he does and every couple of years put out a new album, as well as continue to work with the All-Stars, I'm, I'm just so uh, thoroughly impressed with uh, his state of mind right now and where he's going with his music. It's not just that. It's, it's the whole package of who Ringo is. I think he, he realizes that everything that he creates is a part of who he is. So it doesn't matter whether it's his albums or the tours or his computer art, which is something that you know he's been doing the last uh, several years that he's brought out to the public or he's been showing his photographs through the years. You know, that's all part of who Ringo Starr is. And I think that he's embracing it all. And I like uh, you know everything that I'm seeing here. I'd like to see him do more songwriting with different people. In fact, I, he said over the weekend in the, uh, the, his latest video update that he's taking the summer off to do more painting. Mm-hmm. And also, we should probably ask our resident all-star band savant uh, what his picks would be for, uh, for the songs from this album that Ringo will be doing when the all-star band does reconvene in the fall. Well, I, I think uh, Ken, I agree with Ken on the Rory and the, and the Hurricane song, but not for the reason that Ken uh, had put in there, that he had, he's been doing them all. 
all except the last one. Uh, yeah. Concert. I guess he didn't do, what was it, in Liverpool, right? right. In Liverpool, yeah. yeah. Um, that one, so, you know, maybe it's not an automatic, but I, I think it goes in there because it's, you know, it's the, well, one, it's the lead cut, and it, it's upbeat, and, you know, it would play well live. My guess, only a guess, is that if there's a second one, it will be postcards from Paradise for the reasons we talked about earlier. That hmm. there'll be that that instant recognition and feedback. Uh, you know, Ringo, uh, you you want to think he's you know he's having fun with the audience, but I can't help believe there's a a bit of of truth in it. You know, when he whenever he does the second song from the album uh, anthem on this tour, he says, "I had an album out called 2012." You know, and you know there's some recognition from the crowd. And he goes, "Yeah, thanks to the five of you who bought it." Um, <laughs> I think I think you know. It's really sad that he says that. I know. Uh, I think you know. It's just his way of saying, "Look, I know it ain't selling a million copies, but if you like it, that's okay by me." But you know, he doesn't. He doesn't do any such introduction, or hasn't, when he does the first song from the album, "Wings." He just, this, this is all called "Wings," you know? and it's you know, it's it's got a nice reggae beat, and it's you know, at the start of the show, energy is high, and that one has generally gone over much better. Than than anthem on the mm-hmm. on the you know the, the the past few tours, so I think those will be the two. I don't know that he's going to go three tracks deep. I would love the wild card to be Islands in the Sun, mm-hmm. uh, just just as a nod to the band. Or you know what, if if there's only two, I'd like it to be one of the two. I, I like the song, um, maybe not any better than I like, let's say. Um, Bambula, that that that's probably the one that that grabbed me, you know, on the first time through. Uh, you know, that just kind of you know touched a nerve. Like that one a lot. Um, certainly, Rory and the Hurricanes. I uh, even like one we haven't talked much about. Uh, you bring the party down. I like that song too. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tom, do you think he would do? Uh, uh, interesting that you said he would do both Rory and Postcards, because Rory has a Beatle reference in it. Um, the you know who. Do you, mm-hmm. you still think he would he would do both of them? Yeah, I, I think actually that might be the play <laughs> this time through. Okay. Uh, and as I said before, really, it's he's got opportunity and he's got motive uh, right now. So. Okay, I kind of think that that you know who might uh, because they both have Beatle references might be the uh, the reason he leaves one out. But mm-hmm. it, no, I, don't, I don't think one would preclude the other um, on that. I mean, it's a good point, but I don't think I think if anything, he'd say, you know what. That might help get, you know, it might get a little bit more of a response on the new stuff. That's probably true, actually. You're right. No, if I had to guess, Rory and the Hurricanes is a lock. Probably Postcards from Paradise. I'd rather that he did um, Touch and Go because it's a great rock song. Mm-hmm. But just for, you know, the whole, like, you can see a whole video being shown on the screen during Postcards from Paradise. Oh, sure. With lots of right. Beatle photos. You know, you can see that automatically. So sure. Copy copy, but, uh, it, copy it from Paul. There you go. <laughs> Well, what what did they do when um, when Ringo used to perform, and he might still, the song for George? Oh, never without you, yeah. Never without you. Never without mm, you. Right. So, right. you know, that's that's a tug at the heartstrings right there. Mm-hmm. So. Yep, yep. All right. So to sum things up, even though, like I said, it is early after the release of this album, if you gave this uh, album a review based on a scale of one to ten, what would you give it? We'll start with Alan. Um, are we talking about in the context of Ringo or in the context of um, anything? <laughs> I never thought of it that way. <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Actually, that's I would, I would, the way I thought of it. <laughs> I would say in the context in the con- of Ringo, it's an eight or nine. Um, in the context of everything out there, uh, uh, maybe a five or so. Okay. How about you, Tom? I'm thinking along the same lines of of Alan. I think it's probably in the top third of his albums. That's to say, if you had to break Ringo albums into A, B, and C, uh, I'd put this in the in the in the upper class. It's very it's consistent, which is real real good, and that's something that's missing from a great many of his albums. Uh, if I were reviewing this for you know Rolling Stone, it would be a solid three star album. All right. But what a, Al, what about, about, on a, about you, you? Uh, on a scale of one to ten, though? Well, if they use five and I use three, let me do that math. Let me get the Excel. That would be yes. the, <laughs> <laughs> that would make it about a six. Okay. Okay. It, All right. I'll, I'll be a little more, a little more generous and give it a seven. Hmm. 
think just because it's a little bit it's uh, it's a little more di- diverse. Although I probably I probably should go back and listen to the last couple of because I really have not listened to the uh, the last two in quite a while. So I probably should go back and revisit those in much the same way that I revisited new not long ago and uh and see how well how well they've they've aged but uh but I would say yeah I would say I would give this one a 7 All right Steve Um by the way I reviewed it with a 4 not a 5 Oh so okay there we go I would say I think I'd give it a um, six and a half. Um Wait wait a minute wait a minute <laughs> You you gave it a four out of five before, so in my math that means that's eight out of ten. Ken, I think the sentence is even higher than that. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what kind of math you're using here, Steve. All right, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll go with the eight. I'll go with the eight. It's it's good enough for an eight. It it is after after listening to it as much as I have, and I have listened to it a lot. um, I'll go with the eight. Boy, I gotta work hard to get you to oh, to, to read that one. Stop. stop. I would give this uh, a nine. I do think that it's consistently strong, and consistency is a key word here. Um, and uh, I also want to say one thing. And and um, I know when it comes to Ringo, forgetting about the first two solo albums, once he did the Ringo album in '73, he got into this this uh, mindset where every album had to have ten songs. And then when it came to the point where, you know, he worked with Mark Hudson, there were a lot more songs <laughs> than 10. And then I know that, uh, for example, with, um, with Ringo 2012, one of the biggest complaints I remember seeing on Facebook and amongst my friends is, there's only nine songs? So uh, this time he's given us 11. So not that that's a tremendous amount, but I, I kind of wish that he'd go back to giving us more than 11. Uh, or more than ten, but you know, quantity does matter. Well, and um, that didn't serve him well, I don't think, with Liverpool Eight. No. And I actually, one of the things I liked about the last album was, I don't want to say the brevity, but it, it wasn't any longer than it had to be. And guess what? It had what two songs that were remakes of his own and a cover. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, out of the out of the nine songs, you know, three of them we were at least familiar with the song itself if not the recording i didn't have any problem with that uh because i think it was all it was it was all you know good quality stuff i you know i I do have to say that i missed the fact he did not do a cover this time and i'm talking about something old um something really you know vintage that uh he had pulled out like he did with the last um i the the buddy holly song um I was really disapp- a little. No, I wouldn't say disappointed, but I kind of wished he had done an, an old song just for the hell of it. But that's neither here. Nor, I mean, that's not to say I don't like the album. I just kind of wish he had pulled out a, a, a song, some kind of chestnut, and had done it. Well, I like the songs on Ringo 2012. I just think that he could have given us a few more songs. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, Tom, he he redid two songs. And then he put Think It Over in there, the Buddy Holly song, which he'd already released anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. He's already on a, a Buddy Holly tribute CD. Right. So you know, there wasn't as much effort put behind that album. It's more along the lines of, here's a collection of songs that I've done in the past year. This is my new album. Uh, you know what, though? What I didn't like, or what I did like, is that it didn't have that feel of, you know, here's here's everything we, we did, everything we did, and let's throw it up against the wall and see what sticks, which is kind of uh-huh. how I felt about Liverpool 8, I know I keep going back to that one, but I think that's a, a great example of it. it there, were, there were many producers, it was it was unfocused, yet it had some terrific songs. I think Harry's song was, was super. Uh, mm. it, had, it had a couple of real good songs, but there's very little I revisit on that record. Yeah, but at the same time, the three Mark Hudson albums, <laughs> I shouldn't just call them Mark Hudson albums, but Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and Choose Love were solid oh. albums, mm-hmm. all three of them. Yeah. And the, the least number of songs we had in any of them was on Choose Love, and that was 12 songs. Yeah. Well, those were all. So, and actually on Ringo Rama, I think my favorite track from the whole mess was one of the bonus cuts on the deluxe thing. Where it came mm-hmm. with the bonus of three or four, I forget how many, three, maybe three or four extra songs. Right, mm-hmm. three. There's a great song in there called Blink, which was just right. terrific. I mean, he's, he's right in his wheelhouse. The, the band is right there with him. The vocals are incredible. How that one didn't make the main cut, Escapes me. It was a lot of great work that he did with Mark Hudson and with that band. So, 
All right, so we've all given our own opinion opinions about Ringo's new album. If you'd like to comment about this show, you can always email us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We also have our own Facebook page at Things We Said Today. If any of you would like to get in touch with me directly, you can write to me at every little thing at att dot net. You can also check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio dot com. If uh people want to get in touch with you, Steve they can do so how they can email me at beatles examiner at gmail.com and i'm on facebook under my name and i have a news group called beetle news and commentary where i post all sorts of stuff and just I, i'm all over facebook that's about the way to say that and also don't forget that we are the show is on youtube where you can stream it you don't have to download it um in addition to all the other places that we have it so there, done okay how about you alan um, probably the easiest way to get me is on Facebook. Um, I've got two of them. One is just under my name, Alan Cozen. The other is Alan Cozen Remixed. And uh, I, generally speaking, even respond to things. So uh, that's probably the best way to get me. Okay. And you, Al? Uh, on Facebook, uh, Al Sussman, um, and Twitter at uh, asus 49 and uh, www.beetlefan.com, uh, and uh, yeah, those are probably. Uh, and I, boy, I should also. I always fail to, uh, rem- uh, uh, you know, bring this up, but also through www.paradingpress.com for changing times, 101 days that shape the generation. Okay, and finally, there's you, Beetle Tom. No, that's classified. <laughs> Actually, uh, my rantings can be found uh, in Beetle Fan Magazine, so you can get me there um, on the festforbeetlefans.com and at Brunch Radio for Joe Johnson's Beetle Brunch um, at brunchradio.com. We have a, a page there to contact us, and there's there's pictures of each of us, and uh, you'll you'll get to see why we're all in radio. <laughs> As opposed to, uh, you can click you can click on right there and send us any of your your comments. God, aren't, aren't, aren't we glad that this isn't on video? Yeah, I mean, wow. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm watching this thing right here. I got the Beatles Sessions album. I got somebody looks like they're casing and Cozen's record collection, and the other two look like they're in the witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been a lot of fun reviewing Ringo's album. So, for Things We Said Today, I'm Ken Michaels, being joined by Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, Al Sussman, and our guest, Tom Franjoon. And 